bring back the social infrastructure that had decayed completely. Now, with that kind of foundation, you can begin to look at improving the incomes of people and providing jobs for them. That is an objective condition. And we don't say poverty is going to be permanent in this country. But we're saying that in the short term, you cannot wave a magic wand and change everybody's circumstances. I would like to I now, would what they have done is years. to let mm. all the, the dog chain sellers on the streets, the shoe shine boys, and everybody think that within the next one year, they're going to create 750,000 jobs, and all those uh, boys are going to get uh, jobs. And that's what I'm saying, that making promises is easy. But you need to be a, a realist to make the kinds of assurances to the people that you can achieve. Certainly, they are not in the driving seat. They, know, they don't know what the actual state of uh, the economy is. And so to just sit down yeah, and say that, and I know, I know, I know what they're going to do. I know what they're going to do. Let's, yeah, let's yeah, take it, hypo let's take it hypothetically. Wait, wait, let's take it hypothetically. Just a minute. No, 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 no. Are they not accurate? Let's take it. For us, it's I know, I know what they're going to do. We have budget statements. I know what they're going to do. We have official publications from the government setting out the economic facts of the situation. Are we being told? Let's take a short commercial break. Let me just say. Let's take a short commercial break and then we'll come back. I'm not. Welcome back. Mr. Mahama, what would you do differently to get the economy back on track? <clears throat> well, uh, bef before I begin to talk about that, I was just going to chip in, you know, what I think Nana and Co. would do if. No, if, no, I'd like you to tell me what you would do. If they want. That's an important matter. If they want. If, I know shortly after that happens, they'll come out and say, uh, Gentlemen, unfortunately, we didn't know the true state of the economy is worse than we so think. That's it. what you're telling us, John. No, you say we don't. No, know. no, that's what they're so going to say. We don't know the true and so, facts. all you the promises so. we made you, uh, unfortunately, we can't deliver immediately. Just keep your belts tightened in the medium to long term. We shall deliver on those but, promises. But that's what, what they're going to do. Yeah, but tell me what but, you would yeah, do. But um, yeah, a lot of programs are in place already, and are beginning to yield results. We put in the gateway program. We uh, we have the free zones program. It's attracting investment into the free zones. Uh, we are, recently we cut the sword to set up a new cocoa processing plant that will process 60,000 60, tons of cocoa and increase the amount of cocoa that we are processing from about 20% to close to 35%. These are all programs that are in place. We intend to uh, tackle ag agriculture in uh, a new way that is uh, speeding up uh, irrigation uh, projects all over the country. Right now we have irrigation dams that we're setting up in uh, most of the agricultural areas of this country. And, um, we have a program to uh, set up 30 more irrigation dams. That is to continue to move the percentage of our agriculture that is under controlled conditions like irri irrigation to a larger percentage rather than the present rain-fed conditions. There are programs in all sectors of the economy that are beginning to yield fruits. We think that one of the problems has been unemployment because there's a steady drift of people from the rural areas into the urban centers. And people are looking more for jobs in the formal economy than previously when they were employed in the informal economy. We intend to increase the rate of uh, economic growth. We've averaged 5% over the last several years. And the intention is to accelerate that growth to 8% with the intention that as the economy expands, it will create jobs. Often the temptation, and what several of the opposition parties try to do, is uh, to give out a program that seeks to say that they would create jobs artificially. I think that it's more natural to grow the economy, and as the economy grows, it would create jobs and uh, get people uh, working. Mm. We have a lot of programs. Mm. It's something that we're, we're, we're carrying out and are going to accelerate in the mm. next four-year mandate. You know, it's interesting. As I listened to him, I, I mean, it was a bit of what he said, I thought, you don't disagree with that, do you? What are, what are, what are the things that, that, that you think are weaknesses in that approach? First of all, I think, I mean, it's, it's refreshing to hear that, to hear the, the, the communicators of the regime now telling us that they're aware that the path that they had been on before, before wasn't satisfactory and that is now necessary well, to move. That. Well, said, that's exactly what I said. we've had those programs that's in what, place that's already. That's what I understand. Okay. Uh, 20 years, which is the, virtually the period that the PNDC and DC has been in power, is virtually 20 years. That period was in other countries' lives enough to transform them from the economies that we have now 
You talk of Malaysia or Taiwan. These are examples of the countries. Of the I'm talking about countries that began very much at our level of development, mm -hmm. who within a 20-year period moved in the case of Korea from 400 per capita mm -hmm. income, mm -hmm. which was Ghana, 60% mm -hmm. people in agriculture, like they were there, to economies where per capita incomes is now measured in terms of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Dramatic transformation of their lives, the lives of the Malaysians who, who today were to seeking to emulate. How have they done it? They did it with one fundamental premise. You cannot develop an e your economy unless you give the producers, whether of agricultural products, whether of industrial products, of services, confidence in their ability to work, take their reward, pay their taxes, and get on with their lives. The government has not done the that. The fundamental weakness of the Rawlins era is that that confidence that should be generated in the indigenous business circles, largely because of the kind of so-called revolutionary actions that were taken, has escaped them. Of course, when the president himself, at the beginning of his tenure of office as a constitutional leader, can get up on a political platform and say that important producers, Ghanaian producers of goods and services, ought, ought not to have their products patronized because they have different political allegiances than his own and that therefore their goods should be boycotted. You know that the kind of signals that is given to the private sector and therefore the response of the private sector to the various initiatives that have been tried continues to be sluggish. Sure, I think, let, let, let me finish, let me finish, David, before <laughs> that. I think that the fundamental difference, get away from all of the, the niceties of economic policies and the econometrics and the graphs and the 7% and the 4%, the fundamental difference that is going to be made with an MPP administration is the confidence that is going to be generated in the business community that at long last, a group have come into office who don't have an equivocal and an ambivalent attitude to private capital and to private business, who clearly support it, and don't support it on a selective basis. Somebody is a card-carrying member of the MPP, so even if he's not a particularly successful businessman, he should be helped. But an NDC fellow who's already got something good, solid going, who's therefore looking for the support that would allow him to go bigger. You say, oh no, this character is not a member of our party. So therefore, even if he's employing three, four, five hundred, six hundred people and, and, and helping the economy grow, you're not going to look favorably on him. You were looking for that once fundamental injection of confidence that people are there who have put their political career behind the idea of private sector development, not monkey socialists like my, my good friend, <laughs> John, my good friend Johnny, John, the, 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 he was the one time Marxist of the 80s. But yeah. we're talking about people <laughs> who have a strong and, 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 and principled belief in the private sector. You must tell and me. therefore, <laughs> yep. can generate, because once that confidence, once that confidence is given that to the Ghanaian be, business, that'll be the signal. To the farmer, yep. that really there's an administration in place that is looking after their interest, that is determined to, pro to promote their interest. That is not just always a major difficulty I've had in the last 10 years. The language about business is always about foreign investment. Yes, our country needs foreign investment. Yes, there are areas of, of, of our economic activity, the capital goods sector, mining, which requires large sums of money, where yes, we, we require. But it would seem as if somehow or other, in the rhetoric, the whole idea of the indigenous businessman, the indigenous entrepreneur, male, female, those who are actually here putting goods and services together, somehow got lost. We intend right. to really push that. And we think that right. if you look at the success stories in the world, whether it is Chile or... You have given examples of that. Let me get into it. Those are right. the reasons yeah. Yeah. for that success. Right. Yeah. John. There's, there, there is a big issue there, and I want you to dwell more on the whole issue of, 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 of business and uh, domestic, uh, domestic capital supporting local businessmen. Is that, is that something that, that, that you plan to work on as a, as a party? Because it seems to be a big issue. It's surprising. I mean, <clears throat> it's, it, it's wrong to take the policing function of government you know, that people do business legitimately and malign government or mis 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 misunderstand that to mean that government is not interested in growing the private sector. 
this government has a clear policy of putting the private sector in the forefront of the development of the economy. And we have stated that several times, and we have demonstrated it uh, physically. You know, Various facilities have been arranged for the private sector to enable them invest and grow. And uh, the, I'm sure AGI and PEF will be the first to ad admit that uh, this government has been very supportive. The government has spoken with the Association of Ghana Industries, with PEF, and uh, tried to find out what their problems are, find out how to resolve it. Often the thinking is that uh, there's a problem with access to credit, like credit is the only problem. There are several problems that we need to resolve with regards to uh, the private sector, not only with regards to access to investment and credit, mm -hmm. but also in the general entrepreneurial training of the Ghanaian to manage a business. Mm -hmm. Several times government has supported business and industry and found to its disappointment that the business fails to grow or it collapses not because government has not been supportive of it, but because there are other factors that have not been uh, uh, put right. Um, there is a natural tendency among Ghanaians to want to have a sole proprietorship to control their own business. So however big it grows, they try to retain a certain family stranglehold over the business. And certainly that doesn't help, even with, re with regards to accessing credit. If I was a banker and you came looking for credit and you were a sole proprietor, as against a company like Unilever, I would most likely give Unilever 10 billion and give you 3 billion because there's no guarantee that if you drop dead tomorrow, your business will continue to survive. But if Unilever uh, is chairman or, God forbid, I, 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 yeah, <laughs> if anything like happened, yeah, um, Unilever will continue to exist. So we need to look at things in a very comprehensive manner and not just mistake government's legitimate concern of ensuring that people do business legitimately Johnny, and what, mistake what, that as Johnny, what, a suppression of the private what? sector. Mm. There are a lot of people in business. I'm in the communications industry. Mm. Ghanaians are in the forefront of the information technology industry. They're coming and they're taking licenses. They're setting up uh, internet service provision services, data transmission. These guys don't know what's going on in the economy. The economy is, is growing, it's expanding. People, Ghanaians are going into business and succeeding. And government is encouraging them to do so. Suddenly, we know that as Ghanaians uh, create wealth or get richer, the economy grows. And who would want to prevent that? Who would want to stop that? I'm going to make a simple point. I, I don't know what is the policing function that would affect a Kwabna Daku, for instance, who's, a, who's, who's an agro, agro industry, some of the most important elements of the, of the agro industry, a chicken farmer yeah, on a large he, scale. He's doing well. He is the <coughs> person whom the president stood and tell us that his goods should be boycotted. This is a man who's producing and exporting out of this country to the region and to the world, mm -hmm. a major industrialist in the agro-processing industry. He's, a, he's one of the people. We had a, uh, another man, a Pierre Menka, who's one of the, f the few people in an industry challenging the multinational corporations, an indigenous Ghanaian entrepreneur who was challenging the products of Unilever and the multinationals in Ghana and the soap industry. In most places in the world, he, would be the person that you would do your best to assist, even, I mean, to, to, to find a way of, of, of boosting his market share vis-a-vis -vis the multinational, who, after all, at the end of the day, whose investment decisions are controlled in London or in, in Amsterdam or in New York and not here in Accra. This is another figure who's the subject of, 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 of attack. You, Addison, who produces uh, paper products in, 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 in Takradi, is another. We, we have to understand this. There is absolutely no purpose in that language that continues to talk about people being thieves, that people are always on the wrong side of the law. And let's begin the language that is about encouraging creativity, encouraging enterprise, encouraging hard work. Simple hard work. Because a great deal of, of life's problems is really ourselves, not, not by any great genius, but that people are prepared to actually work hard. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about making examples of successes in our country. The Ghanaians who <coughs> succeed, people recognize them, whether they're in the world of business, in the arts, in the professions, whichever way it is, and say, yes, these are the role models we're after. We're after a Ghana whereby somebody can become a Kwabna Daku. That's the Ghana we're after. The way after a Ghana where somebody can be 
brilliant communication uh, minister. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I say it, I say it, with, uh, well, you know, we, and we, we are on different sides, but I recognize the skills and the ability. Let's look at a place whereby we are saying to ourselves as a nation, we are going to encourage the best. We're going to make sure that those who have the ability, who have the opportunity, do what, as much as they can for this country.